Today on the Basketball Manitoba podcast, we have Ken Apalko. Ken played high school basketball for the Daniel McIntyre Maroons, where he won a city and provincial basketball championship and was selected to the provincial or was selected as a provincial MVP. Ken was selected as a first team high school all Canadian in the starting lineup newspaper. He went on to play at the University of Winnipeg, where he was a first team all Canadian, five time conference all star, Westman University Athlete of the Year and finished his career as the all-time leading scorer in career points. Oh, and and one thing we have to mention, this was without a three-point line. (laughs) Ken was a member of the junior national team for two years and the senior national A and B team for two years. He is is in the Manitoba Basketball Hall of Fame, class of 1998, the high school Hall of Fame, class of 2013, and the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame, class of 2015. Ken, welcome. Hi, how's it going? Boy, <laughs> it, I gave you a pretty it, good write-up to read, eh? <laughs> yeah, it, it, yeah, the resume speaks for itself. Um, very, very excited. Uh, before I press record, you know, we, I was explaining to you how excited, excited I am just to, to, to do this and, and how fortunate I am. And, and you were kind of uh, mirroring those sentiments saying like, you know what, even with that resume, someone like you, you come on and you say, I'm, I'm grateful to be here. And so I think uh, we, have a, we have a very exciting conversation ahead. Yeah. So, uh, yeah. So before we get into it, um, I just want to say something. So my first memory of you is actually through your son, Matt. So he okay. and I played against each other. And I always remember you being around supporting him because he played for the Westman like you, like you did. And, you know, like I had mentioned in the, in the introduction, you're a Hall of Fame member pretty much at every level you could be at in the province of Manitoba. But I don't want to start there. What I do want to do is kind of start with some of your earliest basketball memories. So what are your first basketball memories? How did you get involved in the game? Well, I, I'm, I'm glad you asked that question. So I, I loved all sports and my dad was really big time into sports, but he grew up in an era where they were, he was the oldest of 10 kids in the family. And so he had to chop wood and all kinds of stuff like that. And he, and he loved soccer and he loved sports, but wasn't allowed to play because he always, even at you know, 10, 11, 12 years old, he was cutting wood or helping out uh, because with 10 kids, not enough food, uh, not, you know, no clothes to wear, stuff like that. So they were a very poor family. Um, so sports for my dad was a big deal. And so he encouraged us to play sports and we were always outside in the back lane playing tin can cricket and, and street <laughs> hockey. And, and uh, one, one day he just, you know, I just, I was dribbling a ball a lot and he decided, you know, maybe I should put up a hoop on the, on the garage. And we had this old garage and it's like, it was, I'm amazed that it would stood that long. It was this old garage because I grew up very poor as well. And so uh, in grade six, I was working on my skills. He put up the hoop and I'm like, Hey, I seem to have this knack for scoring like I, I i had some pretty good hand-eye coordination and i had already noticed that with ball hockey and stuff like that and throwing a football and and um and and, and things like that um and so here i was grade six this is my goal now i'm going to be like one of the greatest basketball players of all time like in my head right like i'm yeah i left or whatever i am and um so i work on my game and i go to general wolf in grade seven And I'm going to try out for the basketball team, which I did. And I got cut. (laughs) So, and I still remember the coach's name. His name is Don Krampitz. And, uh, and and, and in fact, at the sports hall of fame dinner, uh, I mentioned that uh, I had a picture of him on the, on my dartboard (laughs) and uh, I couldn't even recognize his face anymore for all the times that I shot darts at his face. But no, the funny thing about that was I just wasn't that good in grade seven yet. Mm. Um, and, uh, and I still remember one story. So I'm playing for the Westman Don Krampitz used to come to all the games and after the game, he came up and he just said, Oh, great game. Ken, I just love watching you play. And he apologized for cutting me in grade seven. No I way. Forget that in a <laughs> years. I said, coach, 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 I was terrible in grade seven. He yeah. says, Oh, no, but I, you know, I should have seen the potential. And I, I said, no everything's good. <laughs> I don't, I don't hold you in, 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 um, I, I don't hate you or anything like that. Uh, and then in grade eight, uh, I started playing 
I, I made the team in grade eight. Uh, and I also played for this. It was kind of like a, a church. Um, it's called, it was called the Hearthstone Hornets, a United Church League. Mm -hmm. I didn't go to the church, but uh, I had some friends that did and they had a team. And so uh, I played with them for two years and we only lost one game in two years. And actually we won the game that, that we lost. Uh, you have to start the game with five players. And for okay. some that Saturday morning, we only had four guys, a whole bunch of guys couldn't make it. Some guys were sick, this and that. Some couldn't get a ride. We were playing at Inkster school. I'll never forget it. We actually won the game 24, nothing. I had 12 points and, but we lost the game by default because we had to start with five. Um, and so that was our only loss in two years. Did you guys uh, play the whole game four on five or just someone yeah, came yeah, in late? The whole game four and five, <laughs> we beat them 24, nothing. <laughs> I'll never forget that. That was kind of cool. And I still remember the school it was at. I can still remember our uniforms. We had these shiny blue uniforms because uh, uh, that was a big deal back in the day to have some, uh, some, some uh, nice uniforms and stuff. Absolutely. Because it didn't look like they do now. Like, trust me, they weren't that nice. Uh, <laughs> and then the, the, the coaches that I had on that Hearthstone Hornets team, uh, Ken Bradshaw and Wayne Bradshaw, uh, Wayne Bradshaw played for Brandon for a bit, uh, or, or was it UW? I can't remember, but he, he went out to Brandon. That's where he lived and he coached and stuff. And so he was one of my earliest coaches. And what they were so wonderful about is they were just very encouraging. I mean, they could see some potential there, obviously. Uh, and I was starting to grow. Um, and I had pretty good hands and, and, and I was a team player and they loved that part. Like, I never considered myself a, a big deal, still don't. Uh, and I think that's what was really encouraging to them is that I didn't behave like a spoiled brat or anything like that. Like my parents would have killed me anyways. <laughs> like my, my parents made it very clear. They said, that like for school, they would say, teacher's right, you're wrong, we you get a phone call, you're dead. You know, like I, I, to like, like I totally understood that, right? Like it was like, we have to show respect these are your elders. They have your good intentions. So you better respect them. And if we get a phone call that you're not being respectful, we'll deal with it at home. And I totally mm -hmm. understand. That. And my parents were like wonderful people. Like the more I had the most amazing upbringing that you could imagine. Like sometimes I hear stories of kids and their upbringings. I'm like, Oh my goodness. I have <laughs> nothing to complain about zero. Yeah. Uh, had so many amazing moments with my parents and and uh my, my dad passed away about it's almost 15 years now and he was like one of my greatest fans mm -hmm. i miss him like crazy uh, mm -hmm. uh because i could just talk to him and he just was so supportive right um mm -hmm. so it was yeah i had a great start i had a great start and and some of the coaches that i had along the way like it's the who's who of coaching in manitoba like a whole bunch of these people are in the hall of fame for uh -huh. coaching like we're talking Jim Bullock, Dale Bradshaw, mm -hmm. uh, uh, um, uh, Bruce Enns. Um, I mean, I could, uh, Ken Kell, like I could go on and on. I had some of the greatest coaches. And then the other part that was great is I always played on great teams, like with great other guys. It wasn't mm -hmm. just like there was other guys and we all had the same passion. I was so lucky growing up in that era where you know, these guys felt the same way about basketball that I did. I just couldn't get enough. Yeah. Like was, yeah. You know? So Ken, you had mentioned, you know, some of your mentors and, and you kind of threw some names out there and obviously that, you know, the, your first coaches uh, in, in that church league. Now, are there any, and again, this can be mentors of, of any time in your life, but you know, mentors usually stick with us because they, like you said, with your first ones, they were encouraging. Um, they, they tend to teach us something that, uh, we we carry with us whether it be for that that narrow point in our life that 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 time frame or our entire lives where like there might even be things today that you you know taught to your uh, you know your children or or coach people who you coach that you're like these are things that you got from those coaches. Um, now you had brought up your father as well, who I'm, I'm assuming was obviously a, a mentor. Are there any lessons that you still remember you still still carry with you from some of those mentors that you want to kind of speak of right now? Yes. I, as you say, my, my parents were my number one mentors. Um, and what I learned from them was how hard they worked. Mm. Like they, they did, like it didn't matter whether it was something at church singing in the choir or teaching Sunday school or anything that they did in life, they gave it their best. 
Mm-hmm. And that's what they they gave to, to, to us as kids. Uh, I'm the oldest of, of four. And um, I would say, like, we didn't want to disappoint our parents. Like, that mm-hmm. was a big thing. Like, they just worked so hard, worked so hard for us, uh, um, loved us, you know, cared for us, supported us with whatever endeavors. And they were quite strict. I mean, there were, there were areas in my life sometimes where I get a little upset because, you know, I was a good kid. And like, like why are you being so hard mm-hmm. on me? But, but, you know, knowing how I turned out and how things happened later on in my life, I mean, it's all lessons that were very well learned. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I would say also, um, I had some great uh, coaching mentors also, like a guy like Bruce Entz, for instance. He was my high school coach, uh, my uh, university coach. He was an amazing guy. He was, as you, you know, Bruce Entz, I mean, he's so passionate that all, like <laughs> if you're not passionate, sometimes people have trouble with a guy like Bruce Entz. Like he just, like when we went out to eat lunch, he would have the salt and pepper shakers and the sugar and, and he would be doing plays and we're like, we just want to eat lunch. Like, but he just, he just loved basketball that much. Right. And then yeah. there was other people like Rick Bender, who I had in grade 10, I played varsity in grade 10, which was unheard of back in the day. Mm-hmm. Uh, in fact, I think there was a rule later on past that you couldn't bring up a grade 10 player to play varsity. Um, and so I don't know if I, I, obviously that rule isn't there anymore, but for mm-hmm. a few years it was. Um, so Rick Bender was awesome. And then he decided in grade 11, when I was going to grade 11, he decided he, he left to go to tech walk. <laughs> like we were <laughs> devastated. Like, what are you doing? Like we have this good team coming up, like, but you know, he needed a career change. And, and, uh, and so we had a guy named Dennis Russell, who was, uh, he was more of a track coach. I've never been in that good a shape in my life. So in terms of basketball, he couldn't teach us that much about basketball, but in terms of running and outrunning you, oh, Mm -hmm. we definitely do that. And then in grade 12, Angus Burr, who had played for the University of Manitoba, Mm -hmm. he was our coach. Now we had to take lip reading lessons because he spoke so softly and quietly. We'd often say, what did he say? (laughs) (laughs) Like, but, but he was amazing in that, um, he was this university star and he was just a quiet guy, just a humble guy. And he just wanted to give back to basketball. Mm-hmm. And what was good for me there as well is that often in practice, he would check me. Mm-hmm. So here's this university player that's won a, you know, a, a championship that's one of the top guards in the country. And he's a mm-hmm. man and I'm mm-hmm. a stick boy, right? I'm very skinny back then. And he would just, and he was so strong, like, oh my goodness. Like if he had you by the arm like this, like there's no way you could get around him. He was like Daryl yeah. Ramsey. If Daryl Ramsey had his elbow uh, holding you, you couldn't get around him. It didn't matter what you did. Uh-huh. He was that strong. And so, uh, and then from there I went, so Bruce Enns, uh, Rick Bender, Angus Burr, Dennis Russell, of course the Bradshaws when I first started out. Then I had coaches like Irv Hannick, senior men's, St. Andrews. I had Jack Kenyon, junior national co- team coach from Mount Royal College. And then, of course, Jack Donahue. Mm-hmm. I mean, of course, of course. Jack of course. Donahue. One of my, at a pic- there's a picture right there I'm looking at uh, in the office. <laughs> he, he was an amazing, and I learned so much from all of those coaches. And when I coached, I would use things from each of them that I felt were really important. Uh, like, for instance, Donahue. You could tell Donahue something one summer about your mom, like, oh, my mom's left knee is really sore. A year later at camp the next year, he would say, hey, how's it going? Oh, your mom, she had like her knee. I think it was her left, right? It was wow. her left. Like, wow. like how he, he talks to, he would do 200 and something speaking engagements a year. And yet he remembered things like that. So I'm not sure if he wrote those things down, which he might've, I don't know. Or if his memory was just that exceptional, what I used to do is on my iPhone, what I would do is if I talked to a kid or a parent or a coach or a teacher, and they told me something about their grandparent or somebody's in the hospital, I would make a note of it. And then every morning I would check, oh yeah, I need to talk to this kid about his grandma. Mm. And that's something that I learned from Donahue. You're on the national team because you're a good player. He already knows that, right? But he was more concerned about you, the person. 
And so when I started coaching, that was the most important. Yeah. Don't you think I want to win? Of course. I'm like one of the most competitive people on the planet. Mm -hmm. But what I learned from those guys, it's more than just basketball. It's about producing good people. It's about having kids be respectful, having kids work hard, achieve goals, you know, do well at school, like all those that treat each other well, be a good teammate, right? Mm -hmm. For the greater good, you know, those kinds of things, which we now in society really need, don't we? Yeah. Yep. Like I think that's really important nowadays. And I think a lot of that's been lost. Uh, I mean, we still have great kids and all that kind of stuff, but like, we just need to be more respectful and grace and show grace and those yeah. kinds of things. Right. And I agree with you. As I say, I loved winning. Don't, don't get me wrong. <laughs> you remember this Bruce and said this about me and it devastated me. It, I was at a coach's clinic at U of W there was about 200 coaches. It was, it was SAG at the time now it's called sage Mm -hmm. and he was talking about like you like he'd always go like this and he was talking about you just gotta have it like you know you gotta go for the ball the ball's on the floor that you gotta get that ball and you and of course you don't get it all the time but your attitude's gotta be i'm gonna get that ball Mm -hmm. and he said i'll never forget this like it almost broke my heart in two because I considered myself being humble and kind and but I also was very competitive I, I did realize that he said to me, um, he said in front of 200 coaches, if Opolko played his mom in 21, he would beat her 21 nothing. And I'm like, that is the meanest thing I've ever heard anybody say about me. But you know what? He was wrong because I would ask her to play again and I would have beat her again 21 nothing. Like, <laughs> I asked her probably a couple of more times than I would have hammered her. <laughs> So, like, when I thought about it, I'm like, yeah, he's kind of right. <laughs> like, I was, just, I was just very competitive. And my whole goal was if you and I were playing, mm-hmm. I would work you. Like, in preparation for that game, those days beforehand, if you worked an hour, I would work an hour and 20 minutes. Because mm-hmm. my goal was to be prepared, right? Mm-hmm. And. And so that was very important to me. I worked my face off. Like, you know how some people are blessed with tremendous quickness and Mm -hmm. jump to the moon and all. Well, I didn't have very many of those things. Like, I mean, I had had good hand-eye coordination. I was quick. I wasn't fast. I mean, but all those kind of things, right? But, uh, and I could jump okay back in the day, Uh, but not compared to some of the athletes that you see out there, right? Well, Mm -hmm. so what's the, the difference is, is that I outworked them. It's really that simple. Mm-hmm. You know, while we're doing other things, I was at Sergeant Park outdoor courts shooting around. I was in my backyard hoop shooting around. I was at U of W, you know, every chance I could get shooting around. So mm-hmm. there's no secret, you know, why I became good. I think I, I think I had some great coaching. I worked my face off. I was very driven. I was highly motivated. Um, and also then I realized once I was starting to play, I'm like, Hmm, I'm getting pretty good. Like maybe I can get a university education out of this. Mm-hmm. You know, like, like, and my dad encouraged me. He's like, listen, because for him, he made it to grade eight and he wanted like for him, education was everything. And he was mm-hmm. doing everything in his power to encourage us to go to school. And, you know, you, 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 you won't have to work as hard as me. Look at how hard I have to work physically. He worked on cars. He fixed cars. And, um, and so you know, I'm thinking, hey, this could be a ticket to university. Mm-hmm. Well, then as I became even better, I'm like, oh my goodness, this could be a ticket to playing on the national team. Like, I think I, I might be good enough to maybe get a chance to maybe do that someday. Mm-hmm. So uh, I remember in grade 12, I'll never forget it. I was having pretty good success by then with all kinds of things. Uh, and, and I was getting lots of university invites from all over North America and stuff. And, uh, and I remember getting a call from Canada basketball and they wanted me to try out for the national team. I'm like, okay. This is, this is when you were in high school. This was in grade 12. Okay. So I'm 17. I'm not 18 yet. I'm eight, I, would, I would be 18 uh, in September. So I was 17 and they were asking me to go to Hamilton to try out for the national team. Like we're talking Okay, I'm a stick boy. I, I, I have no meat on the bone. 
bones. Okay, not like now. I have lots of meat on my bones now. <laughs> and I'm playing against men. Like, these guys are 27. They, they've mm. played professionally, you know. So I had never been away from home. So, like, so I'm going to Hamilton. I've never been on a plane. Um, like I've never done any of these things before. And I still remember, and, and here's, here's a shout out to Martin Riley. Martin Riley had been on the team from high school. He had been on the team for a few years. He took me under his wing and he said, this is what coach Donahue was looking for. Don't do this. He gets upset. <laughs> do this. And I, I, I have thanked him in person many times for helping me out because even at lunchtime, he would call me over like when I was carrying my tray of food and I didn't have a clue of anybody who was there. Right. I don't know who any of these people are. He would say, Hey, come sit over here. And he would introduce mm -hmm. me to his buddies that were already on the national team and that kind of stuff. Right. And so I, I just like, that was just amazing that he did that for me. And I, as mm -hmm. I say, I thanked him in person many times for doing that. And then, um, so I went to this camp in Hamilton for four, four days, three times a day. I thought I was going to die. I thought I was in good enough shape. And I realized that when you're playing at that level, you have to be way stronger. You have to be way quicker. You have to be way smarter. You have to be way everything, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And I rather quickly. But I thought, I, I thought considering it was my first camp and I'm just a high school kid, I thought I did pretty good. Mm -hmm. Well, I get sent home. About two weeks later, I get a call from Jack Kenyon. He's the junior national team coach. So he introduces himself. And I'm like, my heart is just beating out of my chest. Like, I can't even believe that this is happening, right? Mm -hmm. He goes, listen, we're going to, uh, we're going to Brazil. And uh, we, <laughs> we really enjoyed how, like, we thought you did a pretty good job, uh, considering it's your first camp and, you know, you're just in high school and all that kind of stuff. We would like you to consider, you know, coming with us with the junior national team to Brazil for a tournament. Well, are you interested in something like that? <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh, oh, let me think. I got to go uh, grocery shopping. Yeah, let me get back to you. <laughs> of course I'm interested. So so I went to Brazil when I was in grade 12 with a junior now, And it was like one of the most amazing experiences of my life. Like, once again, like this would be my second flight. So I'm mm -hmm. flying Toronto to New York, New York to Rio de Janeiro, Rio de Janeiro to Sao Paulo, and we're going to Presidente Prudente. You know, I'm like, what the heck is happening here? It was like amazing. And I missed my high school grad. Really? Representing my country. So everybody, like a whole bunch of my friends always say that I didn't graduate from high school because uh, where's my <laughs> diploma, right? Because I wasn't there, right? I'm like, yeah, 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 whatever. Don't worry <laughs> about it. I was doing yeah. something else. <laughs> yeah, so. Like I can't, I, I can't even explain to you how, and so here's the wonderful part about that also is when I went to the airport uh, to go and play with the junior national team, over 50, I'm going to start crying here. There were over 50 of my friends that came to the airport with a big oh, sign uh, wishing me well. And I will never forget the support that I had that way. You know, like all these people, that were my friends like they were so proud of me right mm -hmm. like i'm playing on the junior national team are you kidding me who does that you're just this guy from the west end you know what i mean you, you live mm -hmm. on the same street as us like how is this even possible and that's how i felt too i was like mm -hmm. I, you know, I kept pinching myself like is this really happening and it was and it was like the most amazing experience of my life. Like I'll never forget that as long as I, and when am I ever going to go to Rio de Janeiro in Brazil? Right. Exactly. As a, but as a 17 year old too, like 17 year old and they're paying for everything. Yeah. Like, of course. <laughs> my dad was so proud because he finally knew where his tax dollars were going. He goes, this is, this is great. <laughs> so, well, you can, can so on, like you went on, obviously you played for the junior national team, but you also went on to play for the senior team. So just generally, like, do you have uh, a memory? You had mentioned the one uh, there where your family and friends were seeing you off, and that was a memorable moment. Do you have yes. another Team Canada moment that stands out, whether it be playing, uh, traveling, or anything like that, that, that uh, you'd like to share? Yes. Well, this team, I, so this was 1979, and so we went to uh, uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina. We'll ask, first, first of all, actually, we went to Bahia Blanca, which is, which is where... Um, the guy from San Antonio, the left-hander, he was uh, from Ginobili? Ginobili. He's from Ginobili. Bahia. Okay. So, 
So he was, so that's the tournament we're going to. And there's, there's two smaller tournaments and the top team, two teams from each tournament will then go to the big tournament in Buenos Aires. And this was a world qualifying tournament. Uh, mm-hmm. So this is a big deal, right? And I still remember in, in, uh, in the smaller tournament, we were playing Mexico. I think it was Mexico. Um, some of these games are starting to turn into For sure. or anymore. Like, is, was it, was it Russia? Was it Mexico? <laughs> Argentina, I don't know, I can't remember. So so I still remember I had six points. I played really well defensively. Like you gotta remember, I'm playing guard, but normally in like my whole life I've been a forward or I played inside, right? Or I played mm-hmm. outside, but I'm not checking these amazing guards, right? So my goal is just to stay in front of them. Like I don't want to be embarrassed, right? So if they're gonna jack it over me, okay, at least I'm kind of there. Mm-hmm. So I thought I played really well there. I made some great passes. And we won the game. And I also remember during that game that, okay, so whenever we took foul shots, we always recorded every foul shot you took. So when Donahue would send us home for a couple of weeks, we would have a book and we had to fill out foul shooting. We had to have so many foul shots. And I, I mean, I exceeded that by a gazillion because I took about three to 400 a day. I would put the toss back machine underneath the, the mm-hmm. rim and swish and hit it and come back. And so I could get lots lots of repetition and so from based on that stuff i was the best foul shooter on the team based on all those statistics Mm. so i remember there was a technical foul and i was on the court at the time and a different guy went to the foul line and i'll never forget this jack don you got up off off the scene he goes no (laughs) paul i'll never forget that as long as i'm like I thought I was, I, 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 I thought, you know, I'm going to have to change my pants here because I was <laughs> excited, but according to the statistics, I should be there. Right. Mm-hmm. So now I'm on the foul line and I'm making deals with God. I'm not exaggerating. Like I <laughs> promise to pray every day. I promise to read scripture every day. I promise like I was making all kinds of deals. I nailed both foul shots. So yeah. after the game, here's a lesson that I would, Never, ever forget to this day. I still don't, I, I still use what this, ha- what happened here after the game, everybody's excited. We're in the locker room and Donahue's talking this and that. And he goes, where's a Polka? And I'm like, Oh my goodness. My heart almost stopped because well, what Donahue was really good at was praising you in front of others. Mm-hmm. And when there was correction, he would take you aside because he doesn't want to embarrass you mm-hmm. in front of he made some stuff. He doesn't want to do that, right? What a valuable lesson to learn. So in front of everyone, he goes, you played awesome. Wow. Like you made great shots. You made some, you played some good defense. You made, honestly, Darcy, he could have sent me home right there. If that was the end of my national team experience, I would have been happy with that, right? Because he praised me in front of the team. Mm-hmm. What did I learn from that? When I coached in high school, when your grandma's sitting in the stands and your dad and mom are sitting in the stands and your girlfriend's in the stands, why would I chew you out in front of them? Right. That's when you praise them. And when you want them to change that shot that they took or a pass, then you bring them over and you do that privately. Mm-hmm. Like what kind of a stupid shot was that? Come on, you know better. Right. Yeah. But you don't do that in front of people. Yeah. What a valuable lesson I learned there from Jack Donahue. And then the other story that I have, I, I tell this one all the time. I'm, I'm sure my friends would say that's number <laughs> story number 32. They just number my stories now. <laughs> so they don't have to look. And they go 32. <laughs> They're all jerks. So, <laughs> so I, uh, do you remember a guy named Jim Zoet? I don't. I don't. He played, he played for Lakehead. He was okay. seven foot one. And then he went on to play for the Detroit Pistons for a while. Like he was a okay. really good player. And he played on the team as well. And he had his, so I had the ball on the wing and this was in Buenos Aires. So this is a big game. Okay. It's a semifinal. So I drive to the basket and I'm at the foul line and I go up to shoot because my job was to shoot the ball. I understood that. Okay. Well, I thought I did. And (laughs) I see Jimmy Zoet's got his man hooked and he's asking for the ball. So of course, being a good teammate that I am, I fling the ball down to him and what happens? It goes off his hands out of bounds and now there's a turnover so donahue instead of yelling at me in front of everyone he pulls me over and he says why are you on this team now i'm praying to god i say the right thing right i go mm. to shoot the ball 
He goes, exactly. And why is Jimmy Zote on this team? To rebound when I shoot the ball? He goes, exactly. So if you get a chance to shoot it, you shoot it and Jimmy will rebound it. <laughs> well, you don't have to give me a green light too many, too many times. Like, so if I had a, like my job back then was that if I had an open shot, jack it up. That's, that's mm-hmm. my, job. Mm-hmm. you know, and, and I did that because that's what he asked me to do. And I think wow. that's, I enjoyed Donahue so much. It was, wasn't just about the basketball part. It was about, okay, sorry. Here's another story. So we're sitting in the hotel room. There's mm-hmm. six sitting on his bed. He gets his chair and we go, coach, go. Well, he worked with Celtic players. He worked with the Knicks because he was from New York. He coached Kareem Abdul-Jabbar in high school when he was called Lou Alcindor. Like he knows all these people. He would tell us stories of people that were watching on TV. He knows all these people. Like we were just glued to his face. Like he would talk for like two hours at a time when we would just be, oh, oh, oh. Like it was just amazing, you know? And, yeah. and so another that he was just so inspiring that way. And so I've throughout my whole life, as you can see, I'm very animated. I, I've tried to be inspiring like that, you mm-hmm. know, because I that from him. I learned that from Bruce Entz. I learned that from Angus Burr. It was quieter, but he inspired me that way. Rick Bender. These are all kind people, right? Mm-hmm. And they wanted the best for me. And so when I coached, that was really important. Like I want to treat my players as if they're my own kids. Mm-hmm. Like mm-hmm. special people in my world, and some are not are going to be better than others. Okay. We'll try to find them roles that they can excel in because I don't want to embarrass them or anything. Uh, in fact, there were times where I would want to sub a kid in the kid would look at me and say, don't sub me in right now. Really? Okay. And then the parent later I would hear was upset that I didn't put his kid in. Well, the kid told me not to. Yeah. Right. You know, it, it, they just couldn't handle the pressure at the time. Cause we always yeah. played terms. In that. So, but, but the key thing, I guess the whole thing that I'm trying to say is like praise people outwardly when you want to, when you want to correct them, do that privately. You don't want to embarrass anybody. You still want to respect them. That's mm-hmm. really important. And those kind of lessons, kids will never forget that you're mm-hmm. on their side, that you care about them, uh, that you want the best for them. Cause that's what was shown to me with all the coaches, Irv Hannock, Jim Bullock, you know, Dale Bradshaw, all these guys, mm-hmm. like that's, that's what sets them aside from other coaches. I yeah. Believe. Yeah. When, and uh, by chance, uh, can have you read the book of basketball by Bill Simmons? Or have you heard of it? Oh, I have not. Oh, I'm gonna okay. Have to. Well, it's it's a it's a book about the NBA, and he goes, it's a really big book, but uh, he talks about. I guess Isaiah Thomas talks about it. Uh, I believe that's who brings it up, and it's like the secret to basketball. And the secret to basketball is that it's not about basketball, and that's essentially what you're saying. It's it's yes. about the people. It's about how you treat people. And, and you had mentioned Coach Donahue how you know he's essentially implementing um, sales tactics in certain situations because sales tactics are about making connections with people and understanding yeah. them. And, and, uh, and I think that's, um, you know, that's kind of somewhat been a theme so far with the people that I've, that, that I've brought on the podcast is that they understand that it's always about more than basketball, whether that be because they've, um, uh, had, uh, like had those experiences themselves, or they've now lived those experiences and passed them on. Typically it's both. But um, uh, I think that's just, it's such a, a key, key element. And I think, you know, I've heard other people say, you know, basketball players, athletes of any kind, you know, we're human first. And if you treat them that way and, yes. you, and you connect with them, you're going to get better results. Like you said it, you want to win. And what's the best way to win is to get people to trust you, to feel comfortable and, and, uh, and look up to you. And so I think that's kind of, this, that always stands out. The secret to basketball is, is it's not about basketball. And I think yeah. that's kind of what, what you're saying. Now, I wanted to kind of rewind. We talked about your national team stuff, which is amazing. I love that stuff. But there was a rumor um, when I was doing research. Uh, it said that when you were in high school, uh, that you were being recruited by some Division One schools. Is that true? Yes. Um, actually, they were quite serious. Uh, there were actually quite a few. Uh, I had, uh, I'll give you some of the big ones. There was a University of Tennessee with Ernie Grunfield and Bernard King. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and, and I was supposed to take... Ernie Grunfield's spot because he was graduating. So that's the pitch that they were making me. Uh, so University of Tennessee, uh, Vanderbilt University, uh, Davidson College in North Carolina, Minnesota, Kansas. These were some of the bigger ones. And then, and see, I think what happened was the reason they knew about me, because back in the day, there wasn't tape. Like you couldn't show, mm. like now kids make a tape and then they send it to coaches, right? 
Well, the starting lineup newspaper, it's amazing how many of us that were like all Canadians for high school and stuff, we were being um, uh, recruited by a lot of the same kind of people. I, I think mm. they got over this newspaper and they went, okay, these are the best players in Canada. We're going to go after these players. Yes. Uh, so, so it is true. I, I had like about 20, 25 colleges. Like I was getting stuff in the mail all the time. And mm. University of Tennessee actually sent up uh, an assistant coach. His name was Cliff Weddick. They sent him up here and he met me and my family and I had to get a gym. And because as I say, there wasn't tape and stuff. So they had heard about me, but they don't really mm. know that much about me. Right. Except for what they've heard. And so I had to play for them and stuff like that. And then they would say, they would send me reels game film of their games and stuff. Uh -huh. So they would send it. I would, I would go to school and I would, they would let me use the projector and I'd be watching these videos and then I'd send them back by mail and stuff. Like it was just so different back then. The technology was just so different. Yeah. And, and they would send me stuff all the time. Like, like I got, I'd go to the mailbox. There was something from Kansas. I'm like, Kansas Jayhawks. <laughs> okay. Like that's pretty cool. Right. Oh, no kidding. Like that's that, very cool. So, so then my, my, the, the, the big question was, if I go to the States, so my, my main goal, like when Bruce Entz recruited me out of high school, he said to me, what are your goals? Mm -hmm. I said, well, I want to be a really good basketball player. School is really important to me. I want to get my degree and I want to play on the national team and go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. Those are my goals. He said to me, I will never forget this. He said to me, those will be my goals if you decide to come to the University of Winnipeg. Wow. We'll do whatever's in my power to help you to help you achieve these goals that you have set for yourself. And he did. Mm -hmm. He absolutely 100% did. So my question was, back then it wasn't like it is now. Like you got 200 kids playing D1 basketball yeah. now. And like back then they just thought you played hockey, mm -hmm. right? And so my question was, if I go to the States and play on one of these teams, will I get enough playing time to get good enough to play on the national team, which is yeah. one of my goals, right? And I wasn't sure if I, if I would be able to do that. Um, and so I knew that if I stayed in Canada, I would get to play a lot. And as it turned out, I mean, I played five years and <laughs> I think I did pretty good. And I made the national team. And the only thing I didn't achieve was to, to go to the Olympics. Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, uh, and Coach Entz was a big part of that. If I would have said to, uh, to Coach Entz, I still can't call him Bruce. You still, still call him Coach Entz. I still call him Coach Entz. Like we, we do a Zoom call. Uh, I'm not on it every Thursday, but a whole bunch of players, we talk to him. He's got Parkinson's now and stuff. And so we're trying to be encouraging to him and, mm -hmm. and uh, he's very encouraging to us too. And, and so we just want to stay in touch. Well, if I said to him, I want you at practice tomorrow morning at five o'clock. He would be at there at four thirty, getting things ready for me to play at five. Trust wow. me. Wow, he was that he was that determined for me, because he also knew that the better I am myself, the better our team's going to be as well. So I mean, obviously there's something in it for him as well, but he really um, wanted me to to, to do well. Mm -hmm. um, and then also because I was on the national team, a lot of guys go to the states to get their education paid for. Well, I had everything paid for here. I was a nationally carded athlete for five years. Oh, yes. Okay. That's huge. So I had all mm. my, so if the prof would say, I want you to get this book for sure, <laughs> these other two, uh, you know, you can get them. Well, you should have seen my library because they're paying for all these books. <laughs> the prof said you needed these three. I got all three. Like, why wouldn't mm. I? Mm. I paid, they paid for my pencils. They paid for everything. Plus I got money to live on every month. Wow. And so funny, that's how I actually, saved up enough money to buy my wife an engagement ring. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah. I, I, and then I, I had to borrow a little bit of money from my, from my brother as well. That, this is a good story. I got to tell you the story. So, so we're going ring hunting and I didn't know this, but my wife had already been ring hunting. <laughs> there were rings that she was really wanting to get. One was one I could afford and the other <laughs> one was one that I could not afford. He obviously wanted the one I could not afford. So, so uh, we go ring hunting, and and as I say, I didn't know that she had already gone ring hunting. So we get to this place, this jeweler, and the, and I, you know, 
Linda convinces me this is the ring that she wants. And I'm thinking, okay, I've got this amount, amount of money saved. I, I've, I've taken a little bit here and there for my national team stuff. And I'll call my brother and maybe I can borrow some money and we can make this work. Hmm. So as the lady's writing up this ring, she says, oh, and don't forget the deposit that you put on this, Linda. Linda <laughs> We put a deposit on that ring. She knew that she could convince me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. I love it. I love it. There was and no the, doubt in her mind. The, the stare of death, right? And the lady goes, oh, I guess I wasn't supposed to say that. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. But, yeah. I so, love so, it. So, that was a cool story. Uh, like, and there's another person in my life that I couldn't have done all these things without. Like, Linda who I met in grade 12. She was in grade 11. She was my high school sweetheart. Mm -hmm. And October 10th, we celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Congratulations. Yeah. And, and we dated for six before that. So, wow. you know, in my life for 46 years. And, uh, and all these things that I've accomplished, absolutely, I couldn't have done that without my wife. And she even said to me, don't you dare mention my name. <laughs> <laughs> She doesn't like the limelight or anything like she says, don't mention my name. Well, I'm going to, that's, you know, uh, she's you, probably the biggest support for me ever. I, you know, as a coach, like when you're coaching six nights a week and you have two little kids at home, like, are you kidding me? Like, you know, yep. you got to get sitters and it was costing me money to coach, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. like I $200 honorarium at the end of the year. Walk. Well, yeah. That's thanks. That doesn't <laughs> so, but, um, yeah, she's just been an inspiration my whole life. And, uh, and, and, you know, I couldn't have done any of these things without her. Absolutely not. You know? Absolutely. Well, yeah. I mean, I think uh, not only did you mention her, you told a, a personal story. Uh, so I think she'll be very happy with you. But I well, think, I I think she knew what was coming. She knew what was coming. Let's be honest here. <laughs> so I, I want to I want to actually. So, you, you know, we, we talked about how you got to the, to the University of Winnipeg. Um, now, to say you had an exceptional career, obviously, would be an understatement. I kind of read off some of your, your personal accolades. Uh, you know, you played five years, played every single game, first team All-Canadian, five-time conference All-Star, athlete of the year, leading scorer, all that stuff. Yes. Um, but I want to cue you on something. Um, so it's the rat year and the rat pack. And what are the first things that come to mind when I say that? Well... Uh, what had happened was in my first year, guys like uh, Wade Bilodeau, Paul Player, some of these players that were there, they had graduated. And so now it was kind of like our team. You know, like I, like there were younger guys, like we're talking Don Jackson, Dan Kinnishuk, Brian Toomey, Ron Hutzel, um, and then later on Bob Mago, Belida Geffy, and those guys would come along. Um, so this was the, the, the reason we were called the, the, it was called the Year of the Rat was we were not very big. Mm. Like, like, like when we played against other teams, like we're like, Oh boy, we're in for it today. But we would just, we would just kick and like claw and bite and whatever we had to do. Like we just worked our faces off to try to stay mm. together with people. And there were actually, this is actually true. There were high school coaches that were calling ants to try to arrange exhibition games because they didn't think we were going to be very good that year. Really? Yes, that's actually true. Like, can you imagine how insulting that is? We're university players, right? Yeah. Like, come on. And we've got some pretty good players on our team. Um, and as it turned out, it was just an amazing year. We just, we gave people, like, we might not have won every game, but you knew you played us. Trust me. Mm -hmm. Your tongues would be hanging on the ground. We were relentless. And the camaraderie that we had on our team and, and the, like we just had so much fun. We would go up for team meals and oh my goodness, we had just had so much fun together as a group. Um, and then when we added, you know, uh, Bob Magel and Belay in, in the years after that, then obviously we became one of the top teams in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, in fact, we were, one year we were ranked uh, one more than half the year and Victoria beat us and went on to win seven national championships in a row. That was their oh, first wow. of that's the year we should have won the national challenge. I'm still upset about that. I, I, I'm going to get over it at some point in my life, but <laughs> I'm still not there, you know, because I mean, that was like 37 or eight years ago, whatever it was. Yeah. But we had a chance to actually win and we were good enough, but Victoria, 
they just, I, I can't remember exactly. They beat us by four or five in the semifinal, something like that. Uh, this, this is at the national tournament. Yeah. This is at the national tournament. Yeah. So um, it's just one of those things. Uh, it was in Calgary. I still remember it was at the corral. Um, um, so that was, that was a pretty good, uh, and that's the year I was an all Canadian. So like, I was on the national news. Oh my goodness. My parents saw me on CBC <laughs> television. Like, I can't even tell you how exciting all this was. And as I say, like, I didn't think I was a big deal. Right. So yeah. to be on national TV, really? Uh, so that was a, that was a pretty big deal. That was a pretty big deal. Wow. Uh, wow. Yeah. And I have, I, I, I guess, I guess what I remember most about those guys is that we're still friends now. Mm. Like I went out for for um, shrimp with Ron Hutzel at the Red Lobster mm-hmm. yesterday. Mm-hmm. You know, I just talked to Bob Magel yesterday. Mm-hmm. Uh, last week I talked to Blyda Geffy. Um, uh, a couple of weeks before I talked to Wade Bilodeau, Dan Kinnishuk. Um, um, like all these, a lot of these people are still my friends. And yeah. but the pandemic has just killed us in terms of like I have three sets of basketball groups that I kind of go out for lunch with and. Yeah. I remember one time at Sorrento's, uh, um, the owner there, I, I know him from high school and stuff. And he looks at me, he goes, you're here again. Like it was with <laughs> separate. I was there three weeks in a row with three different yeah. sets of basketball people. Right. Uh, and, and even I'm even hanging around with some bisons now, like John Taylor and Tom King and guys like that. Like, yeah, that was sort of back in the day. You, <laughs> you didn't talk to a bison, like if you're a Westman. That just wasn't acceptable. Well, well, so I, I want to actually ask you this. I mean, just going back to your recruitment, why didn't, was there any thought of going to play for the Bisons or was it like, no, I'm, I'm playing for yes. Coach Enns or what happened yeah. there? Well, actually, actually it came down uh, when I decided that I wasn't going to go to the States because I wasn't sure if I could would get enough playing time. Mm-hmm. That decided between Simon Fraser, okay. Winnipeg, Manitoba. Those okay. were the three, those were the three that I was then considering. And one of the reasons I was considering Simon Fraser was that a whole bunch of guys that I played with on the junior national team, uh, Jay Triano, Kirk mm-hmm. Randa, some of those guys, they were at Simon Fraser and they mm-hmm. wanted us, a whole bunch of us guys to stay together, um, which would help us, you know, with our junior national team as well and our national team mm-hmm. program. Uh, so I really seriously considered that. And I have relatives in BC too, so I would have had support there. Um, and then it came down to, okay, what, th- what three places and, uh, coach ends, I- I'm not saying that, um, uh, that the other two coaches weren't excellent coaches, but he, I-, I just, I just felt that when, when I gave him my goals and he said that those were now his goals as well, mm-hmm. I believe, I-, I, I believed him. Like mm-hmm. I, I just sensed in my heart that he would, he would do what he would say, uh, what he said. And he did, he did yeah. And yeah. He put me in great positions. And I'm sure there's times where he would call Donahue and say, give this guy a chance. I don't know what he did behind the scenes. Right. Um, I'm sure that he was a, an advocate for me behind the scenes. Absolutely. hundred mm-hmm. percent. I know he would be. Um, and so I owe him a lot, but then again, you know, um, so over the years, because I had this amazing career and all this, you know, and so much, I got so much out of basketball. This is why all these years I've given so much back. Mm -hmm. So 25 years, I did Westman basketball camps in the summer, you know, when it's my time off and I'm exhausted Mm -hmm. from my school year where I'm doing way more than the average person. Right. But I did for that for 25 years, I did speaking engagements with church groups and stuff like that, that would bring me in and want me to talk about, you know, my relationship with God and, and then also how that relates to sports and, and, and that kind of stuff. And so I did a lot of that. And then I coached for 28 years mm-hmm. at NBC, uh, 932 games I coached. Wow. And uh, here's an interesting story. I have every single score sheet. I have 900 <laughs> score sheets out of 932. I can't find the folder for my first year. I don't really? know what happened. And I, like, I'm, I'm really good at organizing and I, I don't know what happened to it. That's the only, uh, and in each folder. So I could, I could tell you who was an all-star on that team, how we placed in the provincials, how we Boy. did play. Everything was in that folder. And I, and what I, what I've done is I've donated that to NBCI for their archives. Nice. Um, 
so that if they ever want to look up players or stuff mm-hmm. like that, look it up. Um, one of the great stories I have was like when I was, when I had 499 wins with my program, um, we were playing in Brandon and the guys were very aware of, I was one game away from 500. Okay. Mm -hmm. And because I've done so much for them, I didn't know this, but they were planning something for me. If we win that game on that Saturday night and sure enough, we won the game. And uh, I think this was set up by my, my really good friend, John Golson, who was a coach with me for many, many years. He's still a wonderful friend. And I'm pretty sure he had a lot to do with it. But I came into the changing room. This is where I'm going to lose it. And they were going crazy that, uh, that me, I had achieved 500 wins. Like, who cares? It's just me. You know what I mean? Like, I never thought of it that way. Mm. Um, and they had a cake with 500 wins, Coach O. Like, I'll never forget that as long as I live. You know, and each player individually came up and hugged me and thanked me for everything that I had done. Uh, as I say, uh, you could tell I'm a really soft person as well. Like, uh, even though I'm competitive and all that, uh, I was a very soft person. And I, I really cared about kids. And I, you know, and they could they knew that. Mm-hmm. And this was something they could do for me. I'll never forget that as long as I live. That was that was one of the, the highlights of my of my career that they would think of me. And yeah. then after that, we went to Boston Pizza and we celebrated there and had some great laughs and stuff like that. And as I say, it's uh, it's something I will never forget. You know, yeah. Yeah. I mean, Ron had a bunch of those. He he started to cry too. So I thought, <laughs> well, he started this, so I can I can just continue this. <laughs> Yeah, those moments, and it's and it's and it's you know what uh, I'm going to say this. You, you're probably the easiest person I've interviewed because I have all these questions, and somehow you've you've hit on all of them without me even asking. And one of my you know you know questions I have in front is make sure you ask one of your most memorable coaching moments. Yes, and, yes. I, and I'm, I'm I'm just going to go on a limb here and assume that was probably one of the most memorable ones. <laughs> I got I got two more stories I got to tell you. Because Let's hear them. Involve some big time basketball people. Okay. So my sister sister in law worked for Jostens. Okay. Okay. Important that you remember that. Okay. So she worked for Jostens, and one day at church, she said, "She said, Ken." She called me over after church. She said, "Ken, I got to show you something." I'm like, "Oh, okay, whatever." I go over there. Her name is Angie, uh, and she opens up her her purse and she takes out this this ring thing and opens up the ring, and I'm like, <gasps> "It was a Chicago Bulls championship ring." I said, I said, that's a Chicago, because they made the rings yeah. for the. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And she goes, oh, it's not just anyone's. Take it out. I take it out. It's Michael Jordan's. Come on. First championship ring of six. Oh, no way. So, so what happened was that they had a policy. If there was anything that went wrong with your ring, it got scratched or whatever, they would just make you a new one. And especially it's Michael Jordan too, right? Yeah. So, so I actually wore his ring. It didn't fit on this one. I had to put it on my pinky because he has very long, slender fingers. And I wore Michael Jordan. <laughs> like, I can't even tell you how exciting that was. So at school, when I told that story, kids would come up and they would touch the finger where I wore Michael <laughs> Jordan's championship ring. <laughs> I mean, oh, I had wow. but I, I couldn't believe this thing. It was like the size of like it was massive it had all these diamonds and, yeah. and what was it was michael jordan's that's you know, crazy hitting me and so i said to her like back then we didn't have cell phones or anything like i need to have a picture of this well everybody was taking it out of the vault and taking it home and showing it to people and they were afraid that it was messy, right and so the boss wouldn't allow it to go out of the vault and so i never got a picture an actual picture with it i'm so upset but wow. it's a great story right Yes, then, absolutely. The other story I got to tell you is um, kids were just like, they thought I was the stupidest guy on the planet. And I agree with them. I, I, <laughs> I couldn't, I had to agree with them. So Leo Routens is playing for the Philadelphia 76ers. Okay. okay? They're playing an exhibition game at the Winnipeg arena. Okay. He's playing with Dr. J, my favorite player in the world. Okay. Mm-hmm. That's the game where Dr. J, it was an exhibition game and they come running out. And he's not dressed in his uniform. The okay. announcer says something about 
that his runners haven't arrived. Or, like, I'm like, I was so angry that Dr. J wasn't playing that I actually, and I don't boo and stuff very often. Like I was booing, boo! Like I, I was the whole, <laughs> we were all there to see Dr. J, right? Of course, of course. Leo too. So, uh, and I had played with Leo for a couple of years. So after the game, I'm, I'm just so upset that Dr. Wade wouldn't play. So he says to me, Leo says, Devin Daly and I went to see Leo because Devin had played with Leo for one year on the national team. And so Devin goes to, uh, we go to see uh, Leo and we're talking. He says, hey, listen, why don't you guys, we have an early flight. So we're just, the guys are just going to hang out at the hotel. We're going to order some pizza and stuff. Why don't you come to the hotel and just meet the guys? Wow. I was so angry that I said, no, thanks. What? That is the stupid <laughs> thing I have ever done in my life. Like when I told them, I would tell them this story. They were like, you're kidding. Me. You're kidding. I go, uh, no, uh, unfortunately, I'm not kidding. <laughs> is the dumbest thing I've ever done in my life. I could have met Caldwell Jones, uh, World Be Free. Yeah, they had uh, a good team then. That, they were oh, very good. They were unbelievable. Yeah. Yes, but no, because I was so mad that Dr. J hadn't played. Oh. I said, no, well, thank you. Like, what was I thinking? That, that hurts even me. That hurts me. I'm sorry. <laughs> I, I know. I know. And to this day, kids, like my former players still bring up that story. They go, oh. <laughs> like, you told us this 30 years ago. How could you not? I said, well, I, I don't. I, I'm sorry. I, it was dumb. That's when your <laughs> ego, ego gets the best of you, right? <laughs> yeah. Wow. Wow. So, so I have to ask, like, how soon after you said, oh, no, no, you're at home, you're eating dinner later, you're out with friends where you're like, what was I doing? How soon did it click in? Be like, what was I doing? You know what? It, it happened like very quickly the next day. I was like, <laughs> that's the worst thing I've ever done. Like, I, at first I wouldn't tell anybody because like, who would be so stupid, right? It, it, like, exactly. Like, seriously, who would be that dumb? Nobody. So I don't know what happened. Like I, something, I don't know, something didn't go right. There were some wires that were crossed. We can't win them all. We can't oh, win them all. I, I, <laughs> we'll... <laughs> the, the other guy that I really admired too, was a guy named Jay Triano, mm-hmm. who, you know, um, he now coaches Charlotte Hornets. Like first he started off with the Grizzlies. Then he went to Toronto Raptors. Then he went to uh, Portland. Then he went to mm-hmm. Phoenix and now he's at Charlotte. Well, I was, I was his, his roommate in uh, Argentina. Okay. So, so I, and I mean, I just have followed his career and stuff like that. And so something happened not too long ago. My, my wife said, Oh, uh, Jay, I, I follow Jay Triano on Instagram. Mm-hmm. I said, what? <laughs> Jay Triano has an Instagram? What? Okay. So I said, okay. So I got the information and I sent him this beautiful note and I sent him some pictures so that he, you know, I was hoping that he would remember me, right? Because he's met mm. like a million people in his day, right? And and everybody's your friend if you are in the NBA, right? Mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. Well, I sent him pictures of us, and I sent him pictures of what I looked like back then and everything. And and he sent me this beautiful note back saying, of course I remember you, you stupid. <laughs> like, whatever. <laughs> I remember all the guys I played basketball with. I roomed together with you. Yeah. And one of the pictures that I have hanging on my fridge actually was – that when Jay Triano coached our national team, the tournament that we played in Bahia Blanca, him and me as a player, we were standing in front of the plane. Here he was like 40 years later, and he was now the coach mm. of the national team at yeah. that same tournament. No and way. So put something on, on Instagram, and I was like, one day I was at the doctor's office, and I'm following him, and I'm like, that's a picture. <laughs> Me and the boys, I had these baggy pants and, and I had this Mickey Mouse shirt on and we were standing in front of the plane and there was Jimmy Zoat and Ted Upshaw and all these guys that I was playing with on the national team. Like, it was like, I couldn't, be- I, I'd never seen this picture before. And I, yeah. I know hanging on my fridge. That's and, awesome. Yeah. Jay Triano was basically saying, this is where I started as a player. And here mm-hmm. I am years later. And I'm now the coach of the national team at this very tournament. That's like, so that- cool. Cool. That was so cool. But his note also that he remembered me and because I was praying that he would remember me because he's met a gazillion people in basketball. Right. Of course. I'm just this guy that he met for a few years. Right. So that's that's awesome. That's awesome. Well, I think we're going to wrap it up right away. But but before we go, I'm going to ask you a a direct question here. Um, Like I said, you've you've probably been 
it's almost like you have all the questions I was going to ask you in front of you because I'm just like, oh yeah, okay, he talked about that. We'll just keep moving, keep it moving, keep it moving. So it's, it's unbelievable. I, I've, I've literally got to do exactly what I wanted, which was sit back and listen. So I, I, I thank you. But I'm gonna, I'm, we're gonna end kind of on, on this, this, this question here. So I'm just gonna read it out. So, you know, obviously we kind of touched on this when we talked about, um, you know, the, you know, the secret of basketball, right? It's that's, it's not about basketball. So, you know, you're familiar with the saying, basketball is a microcosm of life, and like life, there's lessons to be learned. So what, what is a lesson or lessons that you've learned through your basketball journey that you think is important for everyone to understand? That's a great question. Um, there's many lessons that I've learned. Number one is you're one injury away from never playing again. One injury. You hurt your knee so bad, you might not ever play again. So never take playing basketball for granted. Number two, God gives each of us gifts. And I guess God decided that he was going to give me this gift of shooting and stuff, which, which was what I was known for, right? Um, and, and playing basketball and being a good teammate. And so the lesson I learned from there is that team, to, sounds corny, to, together, everyone achieves more. Mm -hmm. It's true. Mm -hmm. Like, I can't shoot the ball if no one passes to me. I can't shoot the ball if someone doesn't set a screen and I come off a screen, right? So there's other people that are sacrificing so that I can do my job. And so my job then is to make that basket. And that way your job has now been fulfilled because you're the passer, right? Mm -hmm. So that's really important. Um, being part of a team in any job that you get, it doesn't matter what you do. If you're a good team member, team member, you're going to be respected. You're going to get along. You're going to, um, you have goals that you set, common goals that you set, and you go after these common goals and you, you make so many friends and, and stuff like, and, and when I think back of all the people that I know, like it's unbelievable. And, and a lot of them are through basketball, right? Yeah. Like basketball people are very special. Uh, I'm not saying soccer people aren't and soccer <laughs> friends too. Right. But, but I'm just saying like, there's so many people in basketball that just get it. Like mm. they just understand, like, it's not just about basketball. It's about life. It's about working hard. It's about working together as a team. It's about showing respect. It's about, um, you know, some people struggle. Okay. Many times there were guys on our team, like Belay de Geffy. The guy's a brain. Okay. Like he would read five books before he would actually write the paper. Like he got, <laughs> Great A's all the time. Like, it's incredible, right? Well, he would often help other guys uh, with their studies and stuff, like the guys that struggled, right? Um, and then and then also um, just the camaraderie, the, the friendships that you form. I mean, there's so many positives, but what you dish out is what you receive, right? I mean, it's clear in the Bible. It, it talks about that in the Bible as well, right? Uh, it, like if you want people to treat you well, well, you got to treat them well. It's, it's kind Absolutely. of a simple thing, right? But Absolutely. how hard is it to do sometimes, right? And people are different and they have different opinions. And sometimes your opinion might, might not be the same, right? But you still have to be respectful. And sometimes you want to put yourself in their shoes. Okay, why are they thinking this way? Well, they've had a different upbringing. They've had different experiences in their life. Like, right? I said, look at my family upbringing was fantastic. Mm -hmm. I like, can't say anything bad. Like, <laughs> awesome right i had this wonderful support system my whole life i was very fortunate i know that and then i guess the other things are it was always i guess what i learned also from my parents and that is be humble mm -hmm. be humble be kind be respectful those are all things that you can do those are all decisions that you yes. make mm -hmm. it, it's like you have to do that but it's in your best interest to do that Mm -hmm. Right. If you want friends, you got to be a friend. Uh, and so even to this day, there's many guys that um, call me and they just share their life with me and stuff like that. And I consider that an honor that they would actually tell me about their life and maybe some of their struggles and maybe ask for some help or prayer or whatever they, they need that day. Right. I mean, um, as I say, I've been blessed beyond comprehension. Um, I don't know why God picked me. I don't know. I was just this shy little boy from the West End who just happened to be pretty good at basketball. And it just 
took me to all kinds of places that I never even envisioned, right? Um, I, the last thing I want to say, though, is I, I got to mention my family, like my, my family, like Matt. Uh, you mentioned Matt. Mm -hmm. One of the greatest um, uh, opportunities I've ever had in my life was I coached him in high school. He's the best co uh, player I've ever coached in my life. Um, he was the ultimate team player. Um, many times I would say to him, Matt, if you don't score 25 points, we're not going to be in the top five. It's just that simple. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's what he did, but he would sooner pass the ball than shoot the ball. So yeah. people kidded me and they said, well, he must be adopted because he would sooner pass them. <laughs> I said, oh, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, and then my daughter also, like, I mean, she's just an amazing person. She's a NICU nurse. Um, <sighs> Like I've just been blessed beyond comprehension. I, I have this great support system. My brother, my, I, have, I have two brothers and a sister. Uh, my youngest brother is deaf. Um, he came to our family when he was two and now he's 49. Um, and so I always say, I always, my, my sign language, I always tell him it's improving. He goes, no, it's getting worse. <laughs> <laughs> he's got a really great sense of humor, right? Um, but, but one thing that I, I, I just, as I said, I've been so fortunate in my whole life to be surrounded by such wonderful people that cared about me as a person first and then basketball second uh, from all the way up. And I've tried to pay that forward. And I think I've done that. Um, and now I've got three little granddaughters, right? And so they're eight, six, and three. And so now, you know, I'm loving on them and... Uh, you know, that's my goal now, right? Is to be the yeah. best grandpa on the planet, right? My goal at first was to be the best, you know, dad and all that kind of stuff. I wish I would have brought this up. I, I've won lots of awards, as you know, and, and, and I've donated all kinds of stuff to the uh, Manitoba Basketball Hall of Fame and the Manitoba Sports Hall of Fame because they're in containers and no one will ever see them. And so <laughs> maybe somebody, well, my kids got me this little trophy about this big and it says world's best dad. That to me is the best trophy I have. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm not trying to be humble or anything. I, I'm telling you, that's the best trophy I have. And so with that attitude of wanting to be the best of being a dad and a husband, now that is with my grandkids as well to show them, you know, love and, and compassion and grace and all that kind of stuff and support. And so when they have a ring at game, we're there. When they have a soccer game, we're there. Yeah. Uh, but that's what so many people did in my life as well. Yeah. Well, I mean, Ken, I uh, just want to say I appreciate you. There's so many lessons. I mean, you've just you've shared so so much, and and uh, it is true what they say. You are a, a great storyteller. You have tons of stories, and I I definitely know if I said you know what we got another hour, we could probably talk for another hour, and I could sit back. But we, you know, all all good things come to an end, and this is one of one of those things. So I I appreciate you so much. I enjoyed. Uh, taking this time and and um i'm hoping that everyone else enjoys this interview because i i enjoyed it thoroughly so thank you so much well thank you and i, I also want to say to you darcy and, and adam like what basketball manitoba and the wed lakes and you and the, the the people that are running basketball what you guys have done for basketball is unheard of like in our country like basketball manitoba is out there like we mm -hmm. like people i know like i'm always worried that somebody's going to steal adam from us right uh, he, <laughs> I think they've tried before. <laughs> yes, I, I know. And, and so I, I just appreciate all that you guys do for basketball and like your website. Like I go on that all the time and I'm looking at games and this and that. And I use that all the time. And I just appreciate what you guys are doing for basketball. And as a basketball person, I want to thank you guys for all the stuff that you do. I appreciate okay. it. Thank you. Thank you so much. And shout out Adam, shout out Basketball Manitoba for, for making this possible. So we'll wrap up with that. Again, uh, thank you so much, and uh, we'll say goodbye. Okay, thank you. Okay, take care. Okay. Thanks for listening to today's episode. Please like, subscribe, follow, and share this series, and reach out to us with your comments on the show. Thanks again for joining us.